Thomas Jefferson said, a well-informed electorate is a prerequisite for democracy. The following program is part of the series, Influencers and Media Makers. A number of years ago, CCTV sat down with some of Vermont's most influential voices in media, news, and information access to understand their perspectives about the role of media in democracy and how their decisions shape the way we as Vermonters receive information. Much has changed since our first interviews. The people, the technology and social media, the political landscape, and so much more. Fast forward 20 or so years, and in collaboration with Leadership Champlain, we are revisiting the topic with a focus on what has changed, gaps and challenges across geographic, language, and socioeconomic boundaries. The conversations you will hear with today's gatekeepers provide important, varied, and insightful context to the media in Vermont today. Enjoy. Welcome again, yep. Ali. Thank you so much, Ali Jang. And I want to make sure I'm pronouncing your last name correctly, because yes. um, I've heard, I know my name gets mispronounced a lot. So I want to make sure I'm saying your name Welcome to properly. The Raquel. Um, so Ali Jang, thank you so much for joining us. Um, as we've shared, we're doing a series of interviews with local media makers and influencers, especially on the topic of the role, the evolving role of media and the necessity of an unfettered press for a healthy democracy. Mm. Um, and as we explored this topic, we knew we wanted to get a diverse group of uh, perspectives and representing as many different community members as we can in this conversation. So we've spoken with some TV personalities and we will uh, with additional uh, radio newspaper people, but we were thinking, um, that we wanted to expand this conversation to include leaders from particular subcommunities, multicultural communities in our in our um, in our area, and so that's one of the reasons we asked you today. Now you've had a variety of roles, leadership roles in our community. You've worked with lots of families in the school district, uh, started Parent University, you're at Building Bright Futures, and of course are now an elected city councilor in Burlington. So. Um, you also came here as an immigrant from Mauritania. So in terms of vast experience and perspectives, it felt like you would have a lot of rich, uh, rich insight and experience to share with us. Oh. And I know you don't represent all immigrants mm -hmm. or all our, everyone in our multi multicultural communities, but uh, we would love to hear especially your perspective on it as you represent them as well as the broader community of Burlington. So that's sort of how we thought of including you in this conversation. So Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here. Mm -hmm. um, so our first questions are about democracy and civic engagement in particular. And um, starting off with when you think of our multicultural communities uh, that we have here, how do you believe, how do they access the information that they need to know, whether it's about their local neighborhoods or whether it's about processes related to civic engagement such as voting? Do they have the information they need? Where do they access it? And what are the sources of information that are working well for them? Mm -hmm. Yep, um, thank you for having me. And I think that's a great question because uh, civic engagement matters. And as newcomers, we should feel that we belong and that we are part of the process. And uh, where the new Americans are accessing information, most of the time it's in so many different ways, in so many different areas. Um, there are some who are, you know, educated, who understand the language, understand the system, they can access the information easily. Yeah. And those same people also are able sometimes to, you know, uh, provide the same information they acquire to others who are vulnerable, you know, in terms of the language. And, um, you know, there are also some families who definitely rely on their f children only in order to understand when is voting, who should I be voting for, and why should I be voting for this particular person, for example. Um, but unfortunately, there is not like, a, like a, an outlet where people go and understand what's going on in the civic life of the city and the state that there, there, there has not been. And um, 
but currently there are leaders of the new American communities who decided to come together and try to change that narrative a little bit. Mm -hmm. And those leaders are, you know, people in so many different sectors who understand the system, who are doing great work, and they want now create an organization called the Vermont New American Advisory Council, mm -hmm. which is, um, you know, working to increase civic engagement and uh, provide opportunities for new Americans to have a sense of, of belonging. And it's uh, a working progress and I feel like that's a good start. It's needed and uh, we are trying to provide that service. Yeah. yeah, thank you. And that was an important preliminary conversation that we had with you and with Sandrine Dubuy of the um, of the of VNAC, the New American Advisory Council, um, that was really helpful for us as well in understanding some of those broader issues. And you mentioned that many families are relying on their children. Mm -hmm. That is because the children are the ones who learn English most quickly, right? So you're speaking especially <laughs> of those who who come here without English yep. and have to start really at that most basic level of learning Absolutely. the language. Yep. Um, are there media sources? So it sounds like there's a very piecemeal approach mm -hmm. out of necessity mm -hmm. um, in terms of getting the information people need. And mm -hmm. what are some of the sources of information? It sounds like VNAC is still forming mm -hmm. and developing its ways of interacting and, and helping educate people about civic processes. Mm -hmm. But are there sources? Is it about community leaders? Are there certain media sources, whether traditional or non-traditional? Is it social media? Is it WhatsApp? Is it multi multicultural liaisons in the schools? What are the sources that are yep. that are key to getting information out? Yep. I mean, I mean, I think, you know, let's make the distinction about accessing to information and accessing information about civic, being okay. civically engaged. Okay. And when we talk about civic engagement is about, you know, from my perspective, at least is about, you know, getting involved about what's happening in politics, in society, etc. Uh, but there are also all the sources of information that exist. For example, you mentioned one of them, like the homeschool liaisons, multicultural liaisons of the Burlington School District, who are trained professionals, who are definitely you know, interpreters and cultural brokers, who are able to take information about the education of their children and the appropriate paperwork to families and vice versa. What the school need, what the families need, and the, they are the bridge between those two. People also access information in their places of worship, for example, like the mosques, mm -hmm. and where they go to, you know, um, so many places. We also have the Association African Living in Vermont. They have many professionals from different socioeconomic and cultural backgrounds who are able also to talk about, you know, the COVID-19, who are able to talk about benefits and all of it, VRRP, all of it, you know. Yeah. There are so many different ways. Um, um, but also, you know, most of the time what I have noticed lately is uh, community groups, they are organized in, in WhatsApp groups. WhatsApp, yeah. WhatsApp, which is an app where you can send, you know, audio messages, video messages, or see people, just like Skype. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very popular, mm -hmm. and it's also very free. It's a free, accessible. It's very and people, free. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and people come together, and definitely to, for example, Pant University, we used WhatsApp to definitely have conversation, talk about the classes, and it's very interactive and easy to access. You don't need to sign up. You download the app and you 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 in. And it's from the phone, right? From the from like the phone. On your phone. Any yep. any you know smartphone, you can you can download that app. Um, you know, and what I also notice that when we talk about also information, what's hard is information about what's happening, for example, in the state or in the country. They're not accessing that information from the news outlets in the state. They are not. No. No. They're accessing it actually from their country of origin television. Yeah. So you go to a house, you, you see them in Somali, you know, they're watching Somali television mm -hmm. and they are here in the United States. It's not WCAX, it's not Channel 17, it's not Channel 5, but it's their country of origin, national television that provides that information about what's happening in Ukraine, for example. Right. You know? Right. Um, so in terms of world news, they're accessing that through home. Do you feel like they're also getting news um, about what's happening here in the United States 
from their own news channels at home exactly. in the language in their first language in their first language yep and you know they can talk about trump or whatever you know they can <laughs> <So> <laughs> yes and i think i think i think why it's important well maybe for them is these new outlets here is not providing in one from their own language and also two hearing it in english i mean they will not be able to comment Mm -hmm. But in their own language, a conversation can start. Yeah. People around a cup of tea, they can talk about what the TV is, what is happening in the U.S. But the, the news is not coming from here. Right. You know, that's just an observation that I, that I have noticed. Right. Yeah. And that might work for sort of national level news, but probably not so much with news about Vermont. Like, exactly. Even though we're very important, we're probably not getting reported on in, on the Somali <laughs> news stations is what I imagine. Exactly. But <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, so it sounds like non-traditional sources like WhatsApp in terms of information sharing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what about um, civic? And what about things like voting? Like how are there ways that are working or not working? Nope. Um, you know, and, you know, we're being hosted here by CCTV and that's, you know, part nope. of part of the mission here is like to provide access to yep. information and, and democracy supporting processes. So, mm -hmm. so I think there's also a curiosity about like, what are things that could be happening if, if um, yep. to better support? Yep. Um, you mentioned now a community television that is, that has like a mission that is unique. Mm -hmm. And from my perspective, I do not even consider them as like this big news outlet. Mm -hmm. This is for me, and anyone feels like this is my home. Uh -huh. You know, it's not only about even accessing information, but also pro uh, producing right. your own information. Sometimes you go to CCTV, you see Somalis together, just talking in Somali. Mm -hmm. It's for them. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, that's, that's, that's why it's beautiful, this organization. Um, but also, I believe that also, you know, it does, this organization also does an amazing job by basically uh, identifying you know youth, youth training them giving them the tools in order to go to the community and create their own basically television mm -hmm. their own programming sometimes in different languages you know that's that's amazing um but you know unfortunately i feel like you know uh, seven days did start something amazing you know new american buzz where new americans have like a column Mm -hmm. And there was a uh, reporter named Camelia Sari used to be here and just talking just about the newcomers, their lives, their, they live here. But that, that no longer exists. And it's unfortunate that the other media outlets are not providing that level of, you know, civic engagement, you know, here. But when we talk about also civic engagement, I think VNAC also does an amazing job. And uh, our members worked very hard in making sure that the ballots are now translated in different languages. At least it's a sample in all bo voting booths, for example. Everywhere you go, there is a sample in different languages that you can reflect on and uh, vote. Um, and um, yeah, so basically I feel like uh, it's an ongoing process mm -hmm. and uh, people are identifying the issue and you know it's a fact the matter of fact that you you guys are having this type of you know uh, project mm -hmm. to talk about media and also inclusion in the media I think this is something that we all can produce something and, and learn from it and see where there are opportunities to fill the gap yeah yeah and what you said made me think of a conversation that we actually had here or maybe it was a conversation with Sandrine and with you. I'm trying to remember where it happened, but where we were talking about democracy and civic engagement and skill building, really, and understanding, like, where do you get that sort of learning about what it means to be civically engaged, especially if you come from a place where maybe that was less available mm -hmm. or um, where the processes were different. So mm -hmm. what does it mean to come here and how do I learn? You know, even though some people who are born and raised here sometimes are not so civically yes, engaged so it's not right. just a question of coming from another country but hmm. just how do we develop the skills in all of our community members and what does it take to help people feel like informed i love how you said this place is sort of like home like mm -hmm. it's our place too we can come mm -hmm. here and make our own news mm -hmm. in our own languages yep. um yep. so yeah thank you um we've been joined by kelly no. here <laughs> no sneaking in <laughs> um so another one of the topics that we've been ta speaking to our in our 
speaking about in our interviews has been the topic of news deserts, which I'll read our definition we've been sharing here. Mm -hmm. We define it as a community, either rural or urban, with limited access to the sort of credible and comprehensive news and information that feeds democracy at the grassroots level. Um, what are your thoughts? And again, you don't have to speak only to the multicultural communities. Of course, you have that unique perspective of the mm -hmm. people that we're speaking with. But um, what are your thoughts on what constitutes a news desert? And do you think they exist in Vermont? Mm. Yeah. Um, so yes, I, I don't, I personally, I don't think new, basically it exists and it does not exist. Okay. It just depends. Mm -hmm. It exists in a fact that uh, basically what news are, being told what is important enough for these let's let's say corporate or privately owned news outlet to decide this is a message we want to share out mm -hmm. right so basically in that sense it, it it exists basically because they have the power to decide what to let out what to not let out and also you talk about the let's say the the printing right um, they also have the power who to quote, who to include in the in the in the mm. in the article, and who to not. Mm -hmm. for, for example, and sometimes you can compare two different articles about the same subject, but still you will not see that it aligns perfectly. Each one of them have their own bias, have their own basically way of doing things. Mm -hmm. And they have to stick to it. And even the reporter sometimes is not the one who makes that decision. So in any way, if you hold the media, you have power, mm -hmm. basically. In that sense, it exists. There are some news being told and some that are not being told mm -hmm. because it's not important to them. But at the same time, it does not exist in Vermont. Because in Vermont here, we have so many different news outlets that are very different, that are very diverse, you know, and they all provide abundant amount of, of, of media, of, of, of news. Um, but also, you know, what type of news that they, they, they decide to, to share out, I think is, what we, we have to put it in a balance, right? But from my perspective, it exists and it does not exist. Okay, I think that's interesting that you talk about power, mm -hmm. you know, because I think we're thinking of a news desert as in, is there a place or is there a group, you know, are there holes in where news media, where there's access to media and information, mm -hmm. whether it's a geographic place or a group of people, are there people who aren't able to get what they need in terms of information? Mm -hmm. But you sort of turned that around mm -hmm. and spoke about the power um, and are we inadvertently creating deserts, which it sounds like you don't think we do so much in Vermont, which is good to hear, um, in terms of just our decision making about what, what is news mm -hmm. or the angle that we use to tell that news, okay. the, exactly. the bias that we may not exactly. even realize we, we have as we tell the stories. Exactly. And, and <coughs> this, what, what you just said, made me think also of one thing. Currently, the Muslim community around the world and here they're celebrating the month of Ramadan. Right. You haven't read about it in any media. You haven't watched a clip about Ramadan is happening in the state. Mm -hmm. Our children are going to these schools. Mm -hmm. The teachers need to know, the community need to know in order to build a community. We are not the white Vermont that was here a couple you know, centuries ago. It's changing and we have to embrace that change and the media has a role to play. We have a mosque. The imam has not been interviewed. What is this? What does it mean? The co-workers that you work with, what are the perspectives? What should you do for someone uh, who's celebrating Ramadan? What should we avoid? You know, that, that education. The media have the power to use and educate, but here, it's right here. Right. It doesn't exist. So there is a new desert in that sense. Right. Uh, again, in terms of what gets covered. And so we could take this moment to say that Ramadan Mubarak Thank is you. one of the one of the greetings that we would give at a time like this, right? <laughs> Let's take our little tiny moment for um, educating. But yeah, I had to learn that myself um, before I met with you. I was like, okay, what am I? What do I need to say again? And we don't we don't offer you food right now. So and so are these things. No, but I think 
it is important, right? Like mm -hmm. because we have so many neighbors yeah. who are yeah. observing yeah. Ramadan. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, and thank you for joining us during a month that is uh, the most important time of year, right? Yeah. For people who Plenty celebrate it. Yep. Um, so let's see. Uh, impact of social media. Uh, what what is the impact of social media on news access issues, in particular with maybe our multicultural communities, but just from your perspective, oh. um, oh. Um, if, if it has an impact, you know. So it's, if if it does, then and what is it? Yeah. Um, you know, I think here in in the United States, and compared to where I'm from, you know, um, social media is starting to become something, right? But there, the community, you can access the news anywhere, all the time, in buses, you know, circles, outside, because that's a society is just a, a out, people are outside, people know each other, right? Mm -hmm. But here, it's a little bit different. People are more isolated in their own home, their own job, their own small communities, so there is not that, that level of interaction, human interaction, right? But here, social media plays an integral role of this society. Almost, when you um, when you <clears throat> fighting a war, this not the, the wars through be through, through social media. Mm -hmm. That's where you reach, like the people. That's mm -hmm. where they connected. That's where you send the message, and that's where people react. It can be dangerous sometimes, you know, and very not healthy at all to be in it. Facebook, let's say, Twitter, and as an elected official i know <laughs> that it's sometimes it's just uh, it's just too much because of comments and people who are comment you don't even know who they are right but they can but they're very strong opinions exactly <laughs> yeah strong opinions and um, feel more free to share those opinions exactly. because they have that sort like, of that cover, right? yes. That shield, yeah. yes and no nobody's you know holding them accountable you know sometimes um, but social media, for example, from the perspective of new Americans, I don't think, you know, through WhatsApp, yes, people interact, they talk about it, uh, but also you can become a target as well. It can be very dangerous, you can become a target. Um, the, the social media also can be very, you know, because you can access all type of, personally, I can access all types of information that I, that I look uh, into Facebook or Twitter mm -hmm. quickly, you know. Um, and um, I think um, if it was in Africa, I wouldn't have had that opportunity. But here at the same time, there is just, you need to find the balance, find the limits. You know, when it's not healthy, you get out. When it's healthy, interactive, you, you're learning, you're growing. It's, it, it's good. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, all right. When we, so sort of moving to more your personal experience as a, as a leader in, in the community. Um, from what you see, what makes an influencer? When you think of yourself or other leaders, uh, whether um, yeah. whether on the city council or within the multicultural communities, um, what makes an influencer or leader in those communities, and how do people become trusted leaders? Mm -hmm. um, yep, yeah. yeah. I think um, you know. I think before anything, you have you have to earn the trust first in order to influence people. Mm -hmm. There is something that you're doing well and you're doing uniquely and you're doing, you know, you build relationship basically with people and they know you, know who you are. And I think with that, you have to be authentic, have to be yourself, who you are. Yeah. There is no um, too much basically makeup, for example. You're not you, putting on a show. Or yes, exactly. Yeah. You, be, you be you, you be authentic and you, you know, and I think also having the love of, of helping people, you know, and if you help someone, and I think that someone also will go and talk about you somewhere else, you know, and then over time you, 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 you are accumulating some credit, basically trust from the people that, that you serve. And in one point, if you want to sell this, let's say, cup of coffee, for example, it doesn't matter what's in it. People are not buying it because what's in it. They're buying it because you're selling it. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? So I think that relationship building is so important, being your own self. And uh, people, you know, will, 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 will definitely rely on you, on information that are credible. They'll say, oh, if he says that, it's right. right. Because you, you worked with them and you worked so, with so many people. And, you know, I think be becoming a leader, it's sometimes 
all about, some people are, it's just natural to them. Mm -hmm. It's not something that they don't need similar seminaries, they don't, it's just, they're just natural leaders, right? right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think whatever it is, there should be a power or a love of service. It's not, you're not serving your own self. And um, at the end of the day, it will also show. You're serving people authentically by your, being yourself. And I think you will become an influencer and a leader who is trusted with anything that you say. Mm -hmm. I love that. <laughs> I like that perspective. You, a love of service and um, being authentic. Yep. Seems like great advice for a leadership seminar right there. <laughs> um, <laughs> You're a natural producer. <laughs> <laughs> um, as a public figure and leader in the community and among, you know, these various um, multicultural communities, because I think you, I imagine, are seen as a leader, not only, you're from Mauritania originally, but, but just as somebody who has also had the experience of coming here as an immigrant um, and then becoming a leader, an elected leader in our community, I imagine first of all, that you're seen as a role model, including to other new Americans, right? Whether or not they come from even the same continent, um, but just as somebody who has had a similar kind of experience. Um, how do you reach people? So in your work as a city councilor or a Building Bright Futures, how do you reach people when you need to share important information? What, what techniques do you use? Mm. Like, yeah. I, you know, I rely on social media sometimes and just putting it out there. You don't know who's picking it up yeah. and who's going to respond or something. You know, Twitter, Facebook, whatever it is, have pages where I put information and pages where I just put a question and people react, mm -hmm. basically. And I, I'll, I'll, I'll have an understanding about where people are at, mm -hmm. right? Um, but most of the time also, it's more about, you know, the people that I know in the community too, who are leaders like me. Yeah. And I know, Raquel, if I send you an information, I know you have the ability to send it to 200 other people, mm -hmm. right? Through your work, the network that you are involved in, I think perfectly like that. You know, I go to Jitan, for example, in the Nepali community, yeah. same thing. You know, I have my people, my, my network of leaders also that I give information in order for them to disseminate that information. So there is social media, there is also the community members that are leaders who, you know, are influencers and who are, who have the love of service as well. Mm -hmm. Those two. So it sounds like, um, and I think that's another nice thing about Vermont, actually, as you say, like we have our networks and it's a very small community. Mm -hmm. We, in our program, like we get to hear from commissioners of various departments, you know, it's such a small state. And so we do know each other mm -hmm. across the community. Um, oh. And yep. so even if I don't have the connections, I know who to ask. Like, exactly. oh, I'm going to ask Ali. And who else should I be talking to about this particular <laughs> issue? He'll be able to give me some great names yep. and great sources. And um, OK, in thinking of the term code switching, so I thought this would be an interesting, just as you know, from anybody who is bilingual, multilingual, multicultural, um, and so defining it um, as the process of shifting from one linguistic code, whether a language or a dialect, to another, depending on the social context or the, confirmation, the conversational setting. So if we think of that as code switching, um, when we're multilingual and bicultural, we often resort, resort to cultural code switching as well, right? Like there are things that I would do with certain groups of people that I might not do with others. Do you find a need for code switching as you share or try to get across information for the communities you serve both in, in either direction, whether it's for the larger community or whether it's more specifically for the mm -hmm. multicultural com communities, do you find that you have to navigate yeah. certain, yeah. And, and are you able to say something about that or Absolutely. share with us? For Absolutely, me? yes, yes. I mean, I feel like, um, you know, it, it exists not only from the linguistic perspective, right. but also from just day-to-day -day operation, day-to-day -day life, you know? Mm -hmm. um, there are in places where I go, where people that I am with, you know, we speak freely about anything. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, sometimes I have to, you know, uh, filter what I have to say. <laughs> yeah. Good word. <laughs> yeah. You know, <laughs> it's, 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 we, we have all of that. Um, and I think sometimes also is about because y you have to make things funny in order for funny. this. Funny. Uh, yes. Funny. Okay. Make it funny. Make it yeah. interesting. Uh -huh. 
about because the person, the reading you have about the person in front of you, you know, this is not, you, you should not make this too serious. Okay. Make it, don't make it funny, make it easy, yeah. right? And sometimes people also bring you like a problem, you know, this is big. But you don't want to add a level of stress uh -huh. to them, uh -huh. right? Um, but you have to at least, you know, make it in a way that, you know, there is no issue that we can't solve. Mm -hmm. It might take some time and you switch, you, you, you code switch about mm -hmm. and to make that person feel better. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. um, there is also sometimes even in, in um, there are things that I want to talk about, but I have to code switch, use different language in order for all the people in the room do not understand what I have to say. Mm -hmm. Because you and I understand French and the others don't. Uh -huh. There's all of mechanisms that you have to use, but it all depends on the, the setting. It all depends on, um, you know, um, the situation, for example. But code switching, uh, the, the, those that I like the most is in your dreams, like your subconscious, okay. for example. When you are, let's say, you speak different languages, right? Mm. From my perspective, you are not a good speaker of any language until you are able to dream about that. Mm -hmm. To dream in French, to dream in English, dream in Germany, then I can say I can speak German. Okay. You know, <laughs> there, is, there is all of that. I can explain to you, um, in D.C., when I, I worked in a restaurant, my first job in the U.S., you know, it was break time, I sat down, and then there were two French people, young, I think they came to visit, and they were talking about me. <laughs> I've had this experience too. <laughs> not knowing that I speak French. They, like, not knowing that you spoke French. No. Right. Yeah. And, 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 and to them, I, they're like, okay, is he African American or is he African? Uh -huh. And the woman was like, oh, look at his nose. This guy is. <laughs> this guy is not so here. Uh, and then in one point, you know, they asked me, where is the White House? And I responded to them in French. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. And what was uh, their reaction? No, they were like, oh, well, you know, no, well, you know, I'm, I'm like, uh, no problem. <laughs> Just go to the droite et tu prends à gauche. Tu vas voir. Yeah, but, you know, um, and there I could switch and just to make them feel better, it's okay. Right, like yeah. you brought a sense of humor yeah. to the situation. Yes. I've had the exact same situation because <laughs> I'm a Spanish speaker and yes. where people... I think, again, because of the biases or just not knowing, you know, I'm very fair. So the fact that I would speak Spanish was kind of a shock to them, you know? Um, I want to hear that It's sometimes. kind of fun, yeah. <laughs> it can be fun. And I think, you know, when I think of code switching too, sometimes like there's a sense of formality mm -hmm. um, in some cultures where, you know, I, I think of Vermont as a very informal place, you yep. know, and... Yep. Um, so I don't know, the ways we dress, the ways we communicate, like you said, um, a certain language that we might use yep. in different situations. And that's probably, you know, that's true of everybody, yep. whether you're bicultural or not. But yep. okay, interesting, the dreaming thing. Because yep. I sometimes feel like I don't dream in a particular language. Like I don't even think, like I'm not conscious of what language I'm even dreaming in. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's interesting. Pay attention. What's that? Pay attention. You might be dreaming in different languages. Yeah. But not yeah, it's almost like, yeah, anyway, that's another, I feel like we could go off on a lot of tangents here. <laughs> um, okay, let's see. Perspective on partisanship and bias in media. So it's hard not to talk about media nowadays and think about this and just the whole topic of partisanship as we talk about democracy and civic engagement. Mm -hmm. um, some of our questions for media makers have been around these topics, um, especially in the national media. To what degree do these issues show up if they do? Um, in the information sources that reach people with a little less English or who come from different, different cultural backgrounds, does, does the partisanship that we are conscious of sort of um, as people born and raised here and being English consumers of English language media, does that come across or is that as present for people in the new, the new American multicultural communities? Are they, is it an awareness? Is it kind of a curiosity? Is it a problem? How is it perceived, if it is? Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. I, 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 I don't know that much about, about, about it, but, but, but I'm gonna tell you, I think I talked to, kind of talked about it earlier, mm -hmm. you know, about these medias, they all have their own mission and also 
basically vision about what type of media they want to share out, etc. You know, the printing, sometimes they choose what to quote, what to not quote mm -hmm. about, about the, the person they interview, right? Personally, I always have sometimes issues with reporters because we can talk about this and then what you, when I read your article, I'll call you to just say, hey. I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or you took me out of context. Yeah. Or what are the unpatent elements that I'm like, I ask you to, why you did not quote me on those, mm -hmm. for example. But they all have their own stories to tell, mm -hmm. you know, and sometimes it's just a matter of you understanding what to tell, what to say. Yeah, 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 and that's interesting because what they perceive as like, oh, this was so interesting what Ali said. I'm going to yeah. quote this part, yeah. and you yeah. might be feeling like, well, that wasn't. I didn't <laughs> think that was the important thing. I thought this other thing was exactly. way more important. But you didn't, exactly. you know. And so, when is it bias, or when is it just like, oh, that was really interesting, yep. or maybe yeah, that's something I don't want to bring attention yep. to, right? Like it can be both of those. Um, yep. Uh, somebody that we were just talking to was talking about the difference. Oh, I know. We were watching a previous interview that we did for this series, and he just talked about the difference between um, what's news and what's opinion. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think mm -hmm. when we think of partisanship, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. that feels like something mm -hmm. to many of us that has become such a part of mm -hmm. people saying, "Well, that's not news," or "That should be news," but actually, it's not. It's just opinion. You know, mm -hmm. and I, I. But it sounds like that's not mm -hmm. something as present or as occupying of your thoughts on media and democracy necessarily as no, it is for... No. I mean, yes, sometimes basically, <laughs> because v VT Digger, for example, has this, you know, section about commentaries. Anyone can write a commentary. Mm -hmm. Anyone, right, right? right? And at the same time, they also have professionals who can do investigative reporting. They investigate, they do research, and then they report about something. But those commentaries, most of the time, people perceive them as like it's investigative just because VT Digger printed it out. I mean, put it on their website, which is completely not the right. I can have an opinion about anything, you know? And sometimes, you know, especially about the issue about the police, there were so many people who attacked me about and in their own opinion, but many people I tried to convey the message, hey, these are their opinions. Mm -hmm. Look at my voting record mm -hmm. and do not judge me because of what and the perception of another person. Right. But I think in any other case, uh, people like us or anybody right, who is new here, you have to learn to, 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 to make your own media, mm -hmm. your own news. It's not because you can tell your story better than anyone. Right? Anyone has their own stories to tell and I think um, learning to write, learning to convey a message is always key because it's your opinion, it's, it's, it's you, you produced it, and I think people can react, trust it, accept it or not. Yeah. yeah. And do you feel, so you touched on this a little bit earlier, you were saying that Seven Days used to have a reporter that used to cover yep. issues of particular relevance to our immigrant yep. and former refugee communities. Yep. Um, are there things, are there other, I don't know why that went away. I don't know if you know, but are there things like that that you think could make a difference, um, you know, whether it's CCTV or WCAX or Vermont Digger, you know, what are, is that a particular action that media sources could be taking to better tell stories or more fully tell them or to increase access? What other steps could could yep. the media community be taking? Yep. Um, yeah, that reporter of seven days, I think her name was Camelia Sari. I believe she was from Sri Lanka. I believe, you know, she, she left. She went back okay. to her country of origin. I don't know the reasons, right? But I think they could have perhaps found somebody else mm -hmm. who could just have the new American buzz, you know, immigrant buzz in here. Because when you think about it, 57% of the population growth in Chittenden County is composed of people from new American and immigrant community, right? So, I mean, basically, you think about the amount of houses that we buy here, the cars, we make the economy grow, we part of this society. But w all the medias also need to play their role in making those people understand that, you know, the sense of belonging, you know, we all have to play an integral role. Mm -hmm. You are here, you have stories, and we are news outlet, and your stories need to be shared out, mm -hmm. right? Um, I mean, I feel like, for example, what I was telling you about, um, Ramadan is here, nobody, you know, 
from me, yeah, I'm like my my story doesn't 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 have any importance in this society, right? The sense of belonging, we need to plant that seed, not even for us, but also for the future generations, right. and people feel free, their cultures matter, who they are matter, their sexual orientation or whatever they are. I think we we need to be uh, intentional. Mm -hmm. All of these media, news media, need to be intentional in recognizing, you know, that the other. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, let's see. Are there? Um, is there any before the the last question? Is there anything? Imp is there anything else that you think is important for us to know? Uh, regarding media, democracy, or information access that we haven't already covered? Anything I haven't asked you about or that, that you think is a part of this topic and conversation? Mm. Um, I mean, yes. And I think also sometimes not, do not also absorb any media that's out there. It, may not, it can be from anybody. Do not absorb it all to just say this is true. Yeah. They, t they have a story to, say, to, 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 to tell, to share, right? Uh, but, you know, I think it would be important those who are in the middle of a story also to hear from their perspective directly and not from the media and accept and, and trust that this person is like this or is not like this. Mm -hmm. I think that's an important element too um, that people need to think about. Also. And are you talking about the people that are creating the stories or like the media makers? Or are you talking also about those of us who are consuming media and information? Yep. Do to, not to put be, it, yes. To have so, some critical thinking about what we're absorbing. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. It's, always, it's always important, right? Yeah. And you know, sometimes you, if you pay attention to, you read an article, there are a lot of corrections sometimes. Mm -hmm. They come back and say, oh, the previous version had this, but this version, because they, they, they got called. Mm -hmm. To correct this, it was not, it was wrong. Right, right, right. I think do not consume everything right. and have a critical thinking. Especially in this day and age where things are shared so quickly or, or out of context. Yep. Um, and finally, unless, you know, we may have, my colleagues may have other questions, but um, yep. is there anything that is giving you like a sense of hope or optimism about what you're seeing related to civic engagement, media, information, sharing? Um, yep. are, are there things giving you? Um, or that yeah. you think like highlights or things that are working well or and there might not be you could say nope not yep. right now <laughs> that's okay <laughs> I hope it's not the answer but yep um, I mean I feel like you know I'm hopeful the more that I understand sev channel 17 CCTV channel 17 the more hopeful that I am that um, that basically it's the, that power is not only at the discretion of just few people mm -hmm. because this is a community oriented people can come here and produce and, and you know um, tell their story produce their own media i think i'm also hopeful the fact that you as leaders your group decided to have this topic mm -hmm. which is an important topic we always consume 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 but you taking a step back to think about this who are we missing is this really, I think you just having that aspect as well is very hopeful because uh, each one of you are in different part of the system. Mm -hmm. And I think like whatever you learn from here will serve you in what you do. Mm -hmm. And to be, you know, conscientious about what you, all that you have heard and try to have that lens as you move forward. I think all of those are, are hope because you care, people care. Yeah, I hope that like you, not only will it serve us in what we do, but also in our ability to serve others, like you said, um, you know, having a love of service that, yep. that, that will serve others as well. Um, if you like this and want to see more, watch the rest of the series. Thank you for watching, and please vote.